Jim Bridenstine is director of the National Aeronautics and Space Administration. He's visiting the Wilson Center today to take part in a conference on U.S.-Canada cooperation in space, and he was generous enough to give us a few minutes of his time to talk about the U.S. space program. Director Bridenstine, welcome. Thank you for joining us. Thank you. It's great to be here. Great organization, by the way. Oh, that's really kind of yeah. you to, to say so. I, Speaking of great organizations, I'm of that generation that really romanticizes NASA, its mission, space travel. Yeah. I just bring it up and it conjures up one small step for man. And That's right. we all remember where we were that night yep. looking up at the heavens. Uh, how would you describe NASA's image today? So, so NASA's image is probably different today than it was back then. Back then it was all about Apollo. It was all about getting to the surface of the moon. NASA today is not just about moon. We are, we're going back to the moon. That's a big part of the president's space policy directive one. Uh, but we also do, we do science, we do discovery, we do exploration. We're really um, today more than we were even back then. NASA is a soft power capability for the United States of America. So when you think about the International Space Station, you get all of these different countries participating um, in one of the most magnificent scientific achievements in the history of humankind. Um, and it's really, when you think about how, how we get from point A to point B with the International Space Station in an international collaborative environment where you've got very, um, sometimes you've got countries that are not necessarily um, always on the best of terms, but yet when it comes to space and exploration and discovery and science, we can all collaborate in ways that are meaningful for all of humanity. And so NASA has really become that. Back then, you know, Everybody remembers where they were you know, when, when Neil Armstrong and Buzz Aldrin landed on the moon. Back then it was about the United States against the former it's competition. Soviet. Yeah, that's right. And it was, a, it was largely a US only kind of mission. Now NASA is international, it's cooperative, it's a soft power, it's a diplomatic kind of capability for the country. And we're able to do more for a whole lot less than we've ever been able to do before because of that. There's something you manage that's really almost unique to NASA in that it's not just the technical undertaking, it's not just science. It also speaks to these dreams of not just the nation, but of mankind. That's right. How, when you sit in the administrator's chair and you're looking at budgets and light items, yeah. do you balance those two things that can be very different? Uh, no, it's, it's critically important. Uh, I used to run a nonprofit air and space museum in Tulsa, Oklahoma. Mm -hmm. um, I was a Navy pilot before that, um, but when you think about um, what it is uh, NASA represents to young children. I used to be a, you know, a young person, as most people, <laughs> everybody <laughs> was, I guess. Um, when you think about that, um, NASA has this unique capability of all government enterprise, or really all enterprise in general, has this unique capability to grab you know, a young person and encourage them to do something they would never otherwise consider doing. Going into the STEM fields, going into to be a, a, you know, a, maybe an astronaut or a pilot. Uh, when I was young, a lot of people don't realize the first A in NASA is aeronautics. So we do a lot of aeronautics work as, as well. When I was young, I had an opportunity to go to the University of Texas at Arlington. This was the summer between my fifth grade and sixth grade year. And I got to sit in a, um, I got to participate in a wind tunnel and change, you know, the, the camber of a wing, an airfoil, if you will, and see how it affected lift and drag. Um, and and from that point forward, that was the summer after my fifth grade year, I knew I wanted to be involved in aviation. And of course, that stuck with me all the way until um, I became a pilot in the United States Navy. Um, those kind of, of, of events that are game changing in a child's life, NASA does that all the time. Mm -hmm. As you mentioned, um, where, you, know, you know where you were you know, in 1969 when we landed on the surface of the moon. If you walk around the NASA headquarters and you talk to people um, they can all tell you that, you know, if they were alive then, they can all tell you where they were on that night. Um, and that was a big piece of why they became the people that they are today. Now, did you, 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 the right, speaking of the right stuff, you talk about your, your career as a Navy pilot. Did you ever aspire to fly in space? You know, it was never really on my agenda. Um, certainly, uh, I always wanted to be, you know, a military fighter pilot. When I was growing up, I had, I had planes all over my walls. In fact, I had a NASA X-plane, the X-29. On, the, on my wall as well, which was a forward swept wing aircraft. Mm -hmm. um, very unique kind of capability. And I didn't know when I was little, a forward swept wing aircraft, why would, why would anybody, I didn't care. My, my thing was, it looked really cool, so I'm hanging it on my wall. As I got older, I started realizing there's this trade-off between stability and maneuverability. And you look at the technologies that were de being developed in the 1970s and 1980s with flight control computers and composites, and for the first time, in the early 80s, late 70s, 
for the first time there was this collusion of capability where you could actually have hardened wings that were capable of, of flying at very high speeds um, with a forward swept kind of um, design, forward swept wing design, um, but, but you'd have hard enough wings with composites where you didn't have to pay a weight penalty the way you would under normal you know, metal surfaces. And so, um, and then flight control computers with a forward swept wing, it, your, your plane is uncontrollable at high speeds with humans. But if you have flight control computers on board, now a human is one, one, one piece of the whole loop. Um, and, and because of those technologies developed by NASA, they eventually got put into the military. I eventually ended up flying F-18 Hornets, which had the same flight control computers that were developed by NASA back on the, uh, the X-29 program. So there's a, there's a lot of capability. What you describe is something that I think to this day is still underappreciated about the space program, and yeah. it's that spillover effect of where yeah. all this technology seeds its way into just about everything that we do. That's right. Um, when, when we think about how we communicate, you know, I don't know how people are going to watch this, but they might be watching it on the internet, and they might get their internet from space, which is now a, you know, a, a, a growing market for not just the United States, but for the world. A lot of people get DirecTV, Dish Network, XM Communications for radio. Um, space has transformed the way we communicate. It's also transformed the way we navigate, the way we produce food, the way we produce energy, how we do national security and defense, the way we predict weather, the way we understand the climate, the way we do banking requires a GPS timing signal. Our very way of life, every single one of us, every person who's watching this is dependent on space for their everyday lives and they don't know it. Um, now, a lot of times people talk about NASA and they talk about Velcro or they talk about Tang, mm -hmm. right? Those are great capabilities and spinoffs. Um, but it's so much more than that. Um, when you think about uh, the technologies that go into airliners, for example, every time you fly in an airliner, you're, you're flying with NASA technology, whether it's the, the engines or the control surfaces or ultimately the flight control computers. It's all developed by NASA. Of the current uh, priorities and missions, which are you most excited about? Going to the moon. The President's Space Policy Directive 1 says... Manned flight again. Absolutely. And so next year, we're going to launch for the first time since the retirements of the space shuttles back in 2011. We're going to launch American astronauts from American soil on American rockets. So that's going to happen next year for the first time since 2011. So when I say next year, you know, we're, we're talking about 2019. All that being the, being the case, um, that's going to get our astronauts to the International Space Station and home safely, um, so we're not dependent on the Russians. We've had a great relationship with Russia on the International Space Station to include using Soyuz rockets to take our astronauts back and forth to the ISS, um, but we want it to be more of a collaboration and less of a dependency. Mm -hmm. So we got to get um, America launching on its own rockets against la launching humans on its own rockets again. So that, that, that's underway right now with two different commercial crew providers, SpaceX and Boeing, taking us to the International Space Station. But we also have under development right now the largest rocket ever built in humankind called the Space Launch System with the Orion crew capsule. This is our deep space rocket that's going to take us back to the moon. Um, and this time, and the president has been clear, when we go back to the moon, this time we're going to go sustainably. We're not going to go and leave flags and footprints, come home and never go back again. Are we talking about building a colony? We're talking about building a sustainable access to go back and forth. Mm -hmm. So a couple of things. The answer, the colony, the, depends how you define what a colony is. But at the end of the day, we want to have a permanent presence on the surface of the moon with robots and rovers, but also with humans. Not necessarily humans there all the time, but human capability uh, to, to get there whenever we need to get there. Uh, to do that, we need to take advantage of reusability. So we know what happens. We've all seen the images of rockets launching things into space and then coming back and landing. That's reusable rockets. It's dropping the cost of access to space, increasing the access of space. We need everything from the Earth to the Moon to be reusable. So not just getting into Earth orbit, but getting from Earth orbit to lunar orbit, those tugs to be reusable. We need a, a reusable command module. If you think back to the Apollo era, we know the, the command module stayed in orbit around the moon while Neil Armstrong and Buzz Aldrin went to the surface. And by the way, we went to the surface. Michael Collins. Michael Collins, Col you got it. Give he, him credit too. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> so he was in the command module, right? But we want a command module that is reusable. So it's, it's not just, the, the reason space is so expensive. Imagine if you flew across the United States of America in a 737, and once you got where you were going, they had to throw the airplane away. Yeah. It would be so expensive, nobody would fly. 
Well, that's where we've been in space for so many years. So now what we're doing is we're going to drive down the cost by reusing all of the hardware. So we need a command module in orbit around the moon for a very long period of time. We call it the gateway. So we're developing right now that gateway. And then, so it's going to be there for 15 years. And then we're going to have landers that go back and forth to the surface of the moon that are all reusable. So that enables an architecture where we can get back and forth sustainably. Now we're going to have commercial partners, which didn't exist even 10 years ago. You think about SpaceX and Blue Origin. You know, a lot of these, there's a lot of billionaires out there now. Plus, we've got great commercial partners with Boeing and, and Lockheed and others. Uh, we're going to take advantage of commercial partners, international partners, and build a sustainable architecture at the moon so we can get back and forth when we need to. The other thing that's important about the President's Space Policy Directive 1 is that he wants to utilize the resources of the moon. So think about this. From 1969 until 2008, we believed the moon was bone dry. 2008, India made a discovery. Then NASA doubled down on, doubled down on it in, in 2009. We now know that there's hundreds of billions of tons of water ice on the surface of the moon. What does that mean? Water ice represents life support. It's water to drink, it's air to breathe, but it's also rocket fuel. If you crack H2O into its com components, component parts, hydrogen and oxygen, and you put it into cryogenic form, liquid form, that's the same rocket fuel that powered the space shuttles. It's the same rocket fuel that's gonna power the space launch system. So you, you talk about utilizing the resources of the moon that we now know are there, what, what can that enable us to do? So Space Policy Directive 1 says we're gonna go back to the moon, we're gonna go sustainably, we're gonna take advantage of commercial partners and international partners, and we're gonna use the resources of the moon, and we're gonna do all of this to ultimately get to Mars. Amazing. We're gonna retire the risk, and we're gonna prove the technology, the capability, we're gonna prove the human physiology, and then that gateway I talked about, think about the, the reusable command module, it's gonna be in orbit around the moon for 15 years. That gateway, the first one, is about access to more parts of the moon than we've ever been to before. Remember, 1969 to 2008, we believe the moon was bone dry. What else do we not know about the moon? There is a lot. Is there a timeline for the Mars mission? I don't want to put you on a John Kennedy yeah, we're, spot here. To, we're, we're targeting the mid-2030s. Mid-2030s. But that, that gateway, remember the gateway, yeah. um, that's to get to more parts of the moon than ever before with landers, reusable landers, and, that, and it's open architecture. So if you have a company that you want to start and get to the surface of the moon, we, we want to use the gateway to help you get to the moon, right? But that, that, the second gateway is a deep space transport that we want to replicate all of this architecture. The second gateway will take us to Mars and create the reusable architecture at Mars. Speaking of the international uh, cooperation uh, and the levels of cooperation, let's talk about uh, the Canada Institute event you're here for today yeah. and talk about Canada and your work with Canada. So Canada has been a long time partner with NASA since our beginning, since their beginning. Um, even before they existed, they were partnering with the Defense Research Board of Canada, which was a capability that NASA tapped into a lot of their technology and capabilities. But NASA's, or Canada has been involved in space um, because of the aurora, if you will, the, the interaction between the sun and charged particles. Um, you, you, you talk about coronal mass ejections or solar flares and those charged particles that hit the earth and inter interact with the magnetosphere of the earth. Canada, Canada's been you know, interested in that for really centuries, quite frankly, and, and, and they've really helped us get a better understanding going back to, you know, you know, dozens of years ago, help us get a better understanding of the ionosphere and, and ultimately how uh, those charged particles could affect human physiology and things like that. So Canada has been there with the United States for a long time doing space. People are familiar with the Canada arm, which of course was a robotic arm on the space shuttles, but also on the International Space Station. Um, and we want them involved in the gateway, which is going to be our, our capability at the moon. Uh, so they've been with us, you know, all of these years, helping us achieve these <laughs> monumental achievements. We want their collaboration. Of, co of course, the Wilson Center put on this forum today to help us talk about how Canada has been helpful to the United States in space-related activities. And so it was a great, great forum today to talk about all that. In fact, right now, Canada has instruments on the Mars Curiosity rover, which is helping us learn more about the surface of Mars. We now understand that there's complex organic compounds on the surface of Mars. We understand that the methane cycles of Mars are commensurate with the seasons of Mars. Now, the question is, what does that mean to us? That, 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 what that means is that the probability of life on Mars, whether it exists now or used to exist, the probability has gone up. Doesn't mean life exists 
or did exist. We need to temper the expectations yeah, no, that's here, what, but it's still pretty exciting. It is exciting. So, so, so Canada is helping us with the instruments that are helping us make these determinations. So. Um, we're, we're thrilled about the relationship. We want to keep it strong. What about the, the level of support for NASA? I know you had some contentious uh, confirmation hearings. Might yeah. be a, a sign of the times as much as anything else. Yeah. But what, what, what do you know about how is Congress willing to commit more to a NASA? And space ab absolutely. So, in fact, um, when I became the NASA administrator, even before I became the NASA administrator, the president had his budget request out for NASA. And in his budget request, he asked for an addi additional $1 billion dollars to a, a $19 billion budget. So that's a big plus up uh, for NASA. Now, before I even became the NASA administrator, when I was in fact still in Congress, Congress passed an omnibus with bipartisan support that actually plussed us up $1.7 billion. So there's strong bipartisan support for NASA. We wanna you know, keep it bipartisan. In the House of Representatives, I got great friends on both sides of the aisle. Um, Brian Babin, who is the chairman of the Space Subcommittee on the Science Committee, uh, he's from Texas. He circulated a letter advocating for me to be the NASA administrator. There were 12 Democrats, I'm a Republican by trade, 12 Democrats um, signed on to that letter supporting me for the NASA administrator. But you're right, um, those kind of activities in the Senate ultimately become partisan. Um, there was some wrangling. Uh, but since I've been the NASA administrator, those relationships have really built, they've, they've come across strong. Um, you know, in the way Washington works, one side of the aisle has to be against you, the other side of the aisle has to be for you. It's, it's just the way it works. Welcome to our world. Exactly. But, yeah. but, but here we are, and it, there's strong bipartisan support. It's been demonstrated with appropriations. And, um, and I'm thrilled to be the head of the agency at a time when there is such strong bipartisan support. Final thought, and I say this grudgingly because I'd like to go on, but I know you, yeah. you can't stay here forever. Sure. Is I, I, I open by asking you about sort of a generational, my generation's view of space and the romanticized version of the Apollo missions. And then maybe for a, a younger group, it's the, it's the, the shuttle program. Yeah. And, I, and I ask you what you thought Americans thought of NASA. This question is a slightly different. What do you want them? to think about when they think of NASA? <laughs> so NASA has, uh, as you mentioned, a very romantic kind of history. Um, it also, we, we've been plagued with challenges as well. Um, and so a lot of folks like my generation, we think of NASA, we think, we, think we, we don't remember where we were when we landed on the moon because I wasn't alive back right. then. What I remember, I remember specifically where I was in fifth grade when Mrs. Powers came into our class and told us that, that Challenger had exploded. That, that's, that's how my generation you know, sometimes sees NASA. We love NASA. It's amazing capability for the United States. We need to get back to the days where people remember where they were when amazing things were accomplished by NASA. And, and that's ultimately what Space Policy Directive 1 is about. It's what going back to the moon is about. And it's ultimately what going to Mars is all about. Um, we, we, want, we, wanna, we want NASA to be the agency that everybody around the world looks at and says, the United States of America is doing amazing things, and they want to be a part of it. And if we can accomplish that, we will have done something really good. Jim Bridenstine, thank you uh, for sharing some time with us and sharing your enthusiasm and vision for this. You we bet. really appreciate it. Absolutely. Thank you so much.